good afternoon. Um, thank you so much for joining us for this presentation. Uh, we're really looking forward to talking to you a little bit more about environmental justice uh, uh, and the support that the Biden administration has put in place to make sure that communities that need it have the opportunity to apply for and then manage the grants they get to improve the health in their communities. So I'm pretty lucky today I'm joined by two folks that I wanna share with you. Um, I wanna share that uh, Dr. Sakobi Wilson is on this panel with us. Dr. Wilson, I don't see his camera, but I'm imagining I, I, he's I on. Can, I can there see. he is. Dr. Wilson, thank you so much for joining us. I've known Dr. Wilson for quite some time now from his work, not only at University of Maryland College Park, but also on his work on the National Environmental Justice Advocacy Committee. He has been an absolutely stalwart and vocal leader for communities throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. But really the issues that he raises up for conversation and discussion are felt by communities all over the America. I'm also joined today by Tom Senti. Tom is the acting director of the Communities and Tribes Branch here at US EPA Region 3. So let me review the agenda with you uh, briefly. A milestone achievement for EJ, the purpose of EJ Tic Tac Centers, a summary of the selection of those centers, the selectee list, and finally, we're gonna talk a little bit about EPA's role. Why is there a box in the middle? <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. okay. A milestone achievement for EJ, what am I talking about? For years, environmental justice leaders have been asking for support that would include accessible technical assistance to build community capacity from the ground up. The Biden-Harris administration's Justice 40 initiative, which is 14008, executive order signed on January 27th, 2021, is a milestone. The 17 centers called EJ Tic Tacs will be in operation starting mid-summer. These Tic Tac centers are in place to support underserved communities all across America. There are, these Tic Tac centers are creating a network of over 160 partners across the country. The center structure is going to use the hub and spoke model, which will ensure that communities are driving the technical assistance that's being delivered by the centers. The hubs will be the main applying organizations and the spokes are the partners that are on the ground in local communities helping to deliver technical assistance to the CBOs, community-based organizations in those communities. So, and for those of you who are familiar with the Brownfields model, I've been involved with Brownfields grants for many years, and it was always very frustrating that the communities that most needed the assistance had the greatest difficulty in accessing it because applying for these grants is very difficult, it's time-consuming, and it's resource-intensive. And if you have familiar with that model, what they did in Brownfields is they set up a technical assistance centers for Brownfield grants, uh, uh, grant applicants that they could learn how to write an effective grant. Uh, they got training, they got assistance in grant management, which is often a burden for smaller grant recipients. And the Tic Tacs that Samantha just referenced is modeled on what they had done for the Brownfields program. So what are the purpose and goals of the Tic Tac program? The goal was to establish a network of regional and national Tic Tacs with their partners in order to provide that technical assistance that you heard Tom talking about, as well as training and capacity building for organizations and stakeholders and community partners that may have EJ concerns. This whole situation between, it was a, the, the creation of this program was a joint effort between the Department of Energy, the Thriving Communities Network and US EPA. So let's talk a little bit about examples of the, TA, the training services that'll be provided. How about learning how to write grants in a way that will strengthen your applications for energy and environmental justice communities, related funding? How about managing federal grants? I gotta tell you, as, as someone who has managed an, uh, a grant program in US EPA for more than 20 years, there are tricks in the trade you need to learn. There's a lot of paperwork, a lot of T's to be crossed. How do you learn that? Well, the TikTok tenors can help you with that. How about identifying appropriate funding sources? So if you know you have an issue in your community, but you're not sure which grant makes sense, the Tic Tac Center can help you figure that out. Here's a big one, navigating the government grant systems. I gotta tell you, I'm not great on grants.com, but the Technical Assistance Center is gonna be able to help us all get better at that. It's also responsible for helping to develop partnerships and coalitions. Let's say there's two or three community-based organizations with overlapping concerns. Perhaps the Tic Tac Center 
could pull those groups together so they could put in a grant and learn to work collaboratively. They're also gonna help with community engagement. They'll facilitate meetings. They will offer translation and interpretation services for limited English speaking participants. I think one of the key things that Samantha mentioned that really stood out to me is identifying the funding sources to apply for. It is constantly surprising to me how many different grant opportunities we have in the federal government and we're not aware of them. I find out all the time there's another form of grants that I wasn't aware of. There's EJ grants, there's education grants, there's grants for water. Uh, if, if we within EPA don't have a centralized knowledge of all the grants and programs that we offer, how can we expect a small community to figure out which would be the right opportunity for them? And that's where I think the Tic Tac can really be helpful for them. Let's talk money. It's $177 million nationwide. Each EJ Tic Tac will receive at least 10. Hey, I'm happy to say that the Tic Tac Center yeah. serving our region got $12 million. Woo and that extra $2 million is to ensure that we have the ability to deal with rural communities, such as those in West Virginia. There's a five-year project period. There's inter- and intra-agency partners, like the Department of Energy and the Federal Interagency Thriving Communities Network. Each TIC-TAC will provide direct technical assistance to communities in assigned EPA regions. The national EJ TIC-TACs are going to coordinate with the regional EJ TIC-TACs and fill gaps in coverage develop national databases, host summits, and fill in the blanks. The national EJ Tic Tacs are devoted specifically to addressing the needs of tribal communities. So how did we make these selections? We got over 70 applications in response to the RFAs that we sent out, really robust. Many organizations and partners jumped in and applied for this uh, opportunity. 17 selections were made by headquarters, which is 160 spokes. So 17 main, 160 throughout. Three regions have at least one EJ Tic Tac. That's us, region one and region seven. Four regions get two of them. That's two, five, nine, and 10. Three EJ Tic Tacs will coordinate to cover regions four and six, which is the Southern United States communities. Three national EJ Tic Tacs are being selected. And we have a national EJ Tic Tac exclusively serving tribal communities. Here's a list of all the folks that were selected. Take a look at the National Wildlife Federation. That is for the Mid-Atlantic region. We're fortunate enough to have Dr. Wilson here to help walk us through expectations, timeline, and thoughts around what will be the, the Tic Tac Center that will serve our region. There it is on a map. People learn in different ways and they visualize in different ways. I'm one of those people that when I see a map, if I close my eyes and I still see the map, then it helps remind me what the word said. So I figure other people are like me. So you can see that this is dispersed across the United States. The idea here is to make sure the community-based organizations that have the need have the opportunity to get the help that they need to apply for this once in a lifetime grant funding made available by the Biden administration. Tom, you want to talk about our role? Sure. Um, so how is this going to actually work in terms of what EPA is going to do with the Tic Tacs that we'll be working with? So these are going to be handled as they're not, these Tic Tacs are not grants per se, they're cooperative agreements. So EPA will interact with the Tic Tacs to help design what the work plans are going to be. For each team, there's going to be an EPA project officer assigned to each EJ Tic Tac. And then that project officer and team will work with their particular Tic Tac. They will meet regularly. And I can tell you right now, they're meeting almost, I would say daily, Samantha. Yes. Um, and I, it's going to be a very close relationship moving forward. And EPA will continue to have substantial involvement even after the Tic Tacs are stood up. And we will be measuring progress, making sure that the money is being used efficiently and that we're getting performance because the goal is to, have these new EJ grants be truly transformative, generationally transformative grants. And currently we have certain grants that just went out, the uh, EJ collaborative problem solving grants and the government to government grants, but we do expect larger, and I think Samantha alluded to this before, in the nature of $3 billion of 
um, environment and climate justice grant. And those will be transformative. And that's where the Tic Tacs will really be able to help these communities get involved. But if EPA is going to be handing out $3 billion, it, it behooves us to make sure that that money is spent efficiently and for the benefit of those communities. So we will stay involved. Uh, Department of Energy personnel will also provide guidance and oversight to the Tic Tac network, and they're involved in a larger uh, technical assistance network across the country. And then um, there will be coordination between the EJ Tic Tacs and other federal technical assistance providers. So we want to leverage our um, federal resources and minimize dupli uh, duplication as much as possible. And basically take advantage of the synergies we can have from environmental justice, um, infrastructure, um, places where 5G is needed, all of these elements brought together so that we harmonize these resources and use them to the advantage of these communities that have been underserved for so long. And with that, I think we're ready to turn it over to Dr. Scobie. Dr. Wilson? So this gives us an opportunity not just to hear about uh, what could happen, but to actually hear from a Tic Tac recipient, somebody who's going to be helping to mold and work through the issues here in the Mid-Atlantic region and share his thoughts on this transformative opportunity. Dr. Wilson? Yeah, thank you for the opportunity to share. So I don't, I don't have any slides, so I'll just uh, try to walk people through uh, what we're going to do. So as was stated um, by Samantha, the parent of the prom applicant, um, the lead applicant is the National Wildlife Federation, but we're using a spoke and hub approach. So we have our core partners and then we have our hub partners. So the way we just, uh, set up our uh, tic tac for region three, and of course region three of the EPA includes uh, Virginia, West Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, DC, and Pennsylvania. We have the National Wildlife Federation as the primary um, parent partner. We have the University of Maryland as uh, the core academic um, sort of uh, science support technical assistance partner. That includes my team with the Community Engagement uh, Center for Community Engagement and Environmental Health. And also, as was alluded to, other uh, uh, federal infrastructure we'll be leveraging. For purposes of our, our project, we have the uh, Region 3 Environmental Finance Center. Uh, which is led by Director Cotting at the University of Maryland. So you have Siege and uh, the Environmental Finance Center as core technical assistance partners. And then we think about uh, the hubs. We have community hubs uh, that are community-based organizations that work in, represent frontline, fence line, environmental justice communities, communities with, with, with environmental justice issues. So we have Jerome Shabazz uh, with the Overbrook Center. Uh, which is in Philadelphia. We have um, Maria Payne and Mike Payne. They're in the Eastern Shore in Southern Delaware. So centers of the Eastern Shore in Sussex County Environmental Health Network. Started dealing with a lot of the industrial, hog, uh, not hog farm, it's North Carolina, industrial chicken farm issues, y'all. Sorry about that. That's my dissertation uh, work. Uh, we also have uh, uh, the, the Empower DC and the DC EJ Coalition as one of those new hubs, and I'll talk about that more. Samantha mentioned that most of the Tic Tacs are getting 10 million. We are getting, uh, we're getting 12 million. So we're, we're adding three new hubs uh, to our to our Tic Tac. We also have Central de Apoya Familiar, uh, which deals a lot with engaging Latinx populations in the DMV area, DC, Maryland, Virginia area, uh, area on environmental health and environmental justice issues. In Baltimore, we have the South Baltimore Community Land Trust, SBCLT. They do a lot of work on uh, truck traffic, uh, CXX, uh, coal pile explosion just happened. There's a large incinerator, the largest medical waste incinerator, a lot of industrial development uh, issues there. And so those are, those are our primary community hubs. We also have two historically Black colleges that are partners on our Tic Tac. Uh, we have uh, Morgan State University with Dr. Mark Barnes, and we also have West Virginia State University. As Samantha mentioned, we are expanding our hubs to bring in additional hubs and we wanna cover Appalachia. So we're working to find a community-based EJ organization to act as a community-based hub in West Virginia. And just a, another hub to cover that general uh, region, more of a regional approach of folks who are dealing with environmental and energy justice issues in region three. So within our TIC-TAC, as Samantha mentioned, we're going to be doing a lot of technical assistance. 
what we want to be able to do through the hubs is use like a chain of trainer model. So we help build the capacity of those hubs, particularly those community-based hubs. And then they'll be able to, to do trainings and workshops, provide technical assistance in their geographic area of coverage, okay? But additionally, the, to, the, the core technical assistance partners, National Wildlife Federation, uh, WIT, uh, University of Maryland, again, SIEGE, and the Fauna Center, we would do a lot of technical assistance when it comes to helping uh, communities in, in Region 3 who may have environmental energy justice concerns. Uh, the Environmental Finance Center has a strong track record of getting access to financing for infrastructure. So they're going to be doing a lot of the lead work on providing support on grant writing. A big deal behind these TikToks, everybody's helping to build capacity, right? Capacity building, capacity maintenance. You got for the organizations, some organizations have never applied for federal grants, right? So helping them understand how to navigate SAM, you know, the systems, helping them log in and get their information. Some folks may not have 501c3s. They may, they may have a fiscal sponsor. So make sure those groups are able to get into the system. And then some groups have never applied for a federal grant. For example, we have already uh, done a couple rounds of workshops uh, to help partners, our hub partners and other organizations in Region 3 to apply for the, uh, the collaborative problem solving model grants that were due back in April, I believe. So that's the kind of thing that we'll be doing. A big chunk of our work will be providing technical assistance so organizations can, can be able to apply for these grants, whether it be the collaborative problem solving model grant. Uh, you had the G2G grant also that uh, one of our partners applied to. There's additional funding that's coming down uh, this summer, the uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund uh, funding as well. There's climate change grants that are coming out. And so there are EPA funding opportunities that will be helping folks. We're doing workshops, trainings. We, we've been doing coaching, consultations, right? So we'll be, we'll be doing that uh, for those grants and also other federal agencies, whether it be DOE and other, you know, other departments, and also non-federal grants as well. Additionally, we'll be helping folks learn how to use, in our TIG Tech, learn how to use a lot of the mapping tools that are out there, like US EPA EJ screen. Uh, the CEQ CGIS tool. We've also built our own tools in the state of Maryland, like Maryland EJ Screen. We built the park equity mapping tool. We're building the climate equity health mapping tool. We're going to help folks do health impact assessments. We're going to help folks be able to do community engagement, their own climate action planning. A, a big part of our project is also helping to connect community-based organizations to partners who can help address their infrastructure disparities. So those contractors, those companies, those businesses and industries that they're on the clean energy sector, not the dirty energy side, but the clean energy side to bring that clean energy infrastructure. And also with the Environmental Finance Center, what you find in a lot of communities, particularly our rural uh, remote communities, there's, there's gonna be not just an issue with having access to uh, clean energy infrastructure, also sewer and water infrastructure. So one aspect of the Federation is the Choose Clean Water Coalition. So they've already have relationships with groups that don't have access to safe water in the region. And then the Environmental Finance Center has been doing a lot of work around stormwater issues. So even though it's not a per, those are not priority areas of, for our Tic Tac, we want to make sure that Tic Tac is one-stop shop in connecting our communities of concern to infrastructure. So clean energy infrastructure and other types of infrastructure, including sewer and water infrastructure, because again, we, we, we want to be customized uh, to the concerns and needs uh, of folks in in this region. So I'll stop there. I could I could share more. I could share more, but I'll stop there for now, Samantha. So you've just shared with us a vision. So tell me what you think are the biggest barriers to reaching that vision. Well, you know, one. That, well, because there's a couple barriers. The region is a big region, right? And we, in many ways, we have this one-stop shop approach with the community hubs, right? But it's, it's also a convenient sample. So they're gonna be able to eat, and not easily, but really to engage communities in their geographic area coverage, right? But getting to those rural remote communities is gonna be difficult. Uh, there's some communities, everybody, we're talking about, you know, capacity building, capacity maintenance. There's some communities that don't have any staff. Like communities that are really in need, how do we get to those communities? And how do we help them get into the system? That's gonna be really, really difficult. And so 
you know, other entities who are already trust agents, right, who are already anchor institutions who may not be part of our core team, how do we engage with those in institutions? So uh, like the Appalachian Commission, I forget the full mm -hmm. title, but Appalachian Commission. Appalachian but Regional Commission. Yeah. Appalachian Regional Commission, ARC. I forget. I'm not an acronym. Y'all know I'm doing Apple uh, acronym suit, but <laughs> ARC is like a rural commission, I believe. Then also CERCAP. Mm -hmm. CERCAP contacted us. They do a lot of work. Uh, you think about like uh, a lot of our land grant institutions, you know, Maryland's a land grant institution. So we have extension service. So we engage in like extension service. Those folks are already trusted, known in the rural, getting to the rural communities and also not, uh, not necessarily a blind spot for us as a tic tac, but work I have not done. How do we engage the tribal uh, communities too? So that's some groups that we have in, engaged traditionally. The National Wildlife Federation does have relationships already with some of the tribal groups. So that's that's a good thing. But those rural remote communities and those high, highly, extremely resource constrained communities, we assume that everybody's gonna be able to apply. There's some folks that a uh, online system is not gonna be appropriate. Mm -hmm. So if how they don't do you, have five so G? Yeah, so one they don't have five G, right? So you got a five, you got an infrastructure access issue, and also you have a technical literacy issue too. So those are gonna be some of the the big the big challenges that we have is really that that folks who don't have five G people who have Wi Fi you know infrastructure uh, issues, and then and then also those populations who may do the linguistic isolation, uh, maybe some language barriers too, and so. From a Latinx side, we do have, we will have some of that cover with Central Day Employee Familiar and that Promotors Network, we can leverage that. But that may be some other groups that maybe they have linguistic isolation that we need to, who may be, uh, you know, first maybe immigrant communities who don't have a community-based organization that they connect to in that same way. Mm -hmm. So there's a number of challenges that we're gonna have to look, look at and come up with solutions. But one of the great things about, at least what we're trying to do, and I, I'll share this, we I'm going to give an EPA a shout out. It depends on how you make it work, though. We have baked <laughs> into our into our Tic Tac leveraging the collaborative problem solving model. So any of y'all know the EPA's collaborative problem solving model, one of the points is you got to, you know, leverage infrastructure, resource leveraging, right? Strategic partnerships. So beyond our core partners, we're, as we implement the Tic Tac, we're going to bring in additional partners who, again, those anchor institutions who already have relationships with those hard to reach populations where it had best practices, communication modalities, and, and leverage that infrastructure. So I'll, I'll stop there. So Dr. Wilson, what happens if I'm a small CBO and I want to be part of this hub? What do I do? So what one of the things that we wanted that we're gonna do, we're gonna develop an intake process and so they help match. So our acronym for the for the hub is for the TikTok is, is match. We have another project called Match, so I got to figure it out. I like acronyms, so what is I Match? I thought you one? told What's me you didn't you? do acronyms, Dr. Yeah. No, I do acronyms. Here, I, I love acronyms, but I, I, I accidentally like recycled an acronym. acronym. <laughs> I, I recycled it. Okay, Mr. Yeah. Match. Uh, so it's called the it's called the Mid it's, it's Mid Atlantic Technical Assistance Center. So it, okay. it comes out, y'all, to be Match. Some of the letters are you turn them <laughs> off, but so Match. So we're going to match people, you know, through an intake process. So each hub is gonna cover a geographic area, right? And so have an intake process where folks can be, con be connected to, to that hub, be connected to, be connected to that hub. And so um, it, it's gonna be important that, you know, we have that intake process, but we have to, to co-develop the intake process with our hubs. And so that's gonna be, that's gonna be part of the process. And we have to do a lot of developing our communication plan Right to get to those to get to those community-based organizations, so that's going to be part of the process. But and it, that's that's built, you know, for everyone. You write a proposal, right? But then you have to build out the work plan, and the work plan yeah. has to get into the weeds. The proposal doesn't get into the weeds, right? You get some level of detail, you get into the forest, but the work plan we have to build in, in, in stages and phases. I'm I'm mixing metaphors, but really get into the weeds. And so we we've had some back and forth. This is a cooperative agreement with the EPA to you know, do our performance metric plan, uh, performance, uh, performance, what do we call it? Smith's performance evaluation mm -hmm. plan. Yeah. So we, we've done that, but we even, so, but the next step is to really build up the work plan. So we have to, we have to develop that even more and find the right partners, uh, develop the intake process. We have to co-develop with our hubs, get feedback on it, right? Finalize it, develop the communication plan, make sure we, and we have to customize communication plan for various groups. 
So there's a lot of moving pieces to making sure that we can, uh, that, that, that a small CPO in Virginia, they may not have the same communication approach or, or, or marketing promotion to them, or they may not engage us, they may not, we may not engage them the same way as a small CBO in Delaware, right? It's not gonna be one size fits all per se. I mean, there'll be some apples to apples when it comes to some of our urban uh, CBOs and our rural CBOs, but there's gonna be some differences in how we have to engage folks. And our hubs would know best because they're working in those communities. But again, they don't have, they're not far reaching. They may not have deep in all parts of the geographic area coverage. So we're gonna have to bring in other anchor institutions that are also in those geographic areas of coverage, right? To make sure we, we again, leveraging their infrastructure would be important for that process. We, we had a question, uh, Dr. Wilson, about um, the timing of the standing up of the Tic Tacs. Do you have any sense of that? You're on mute, hon. <laughs> Still on mute. I, I got like housework happening at the same time. So I'm sorry. <laughs> I was trying to just direct the, to keep the noise level down. Can you just go outside, close the door. Thank you. Okay. We got We got a new door. We got lizards in our house. We got all kinds of bugs and lizards, and energy inefficient door for the original door in the house. So we try to get a new door in the front doors for the, for the house. Sorry about that. So what was the question again, Samantha? About that? Or, or Tom, go, go with the question again. I'm sorry, Tom. It was, uh, someone asked about uh, the timing of the standing up of the Tic Tacs. And you know the upcoming deadline for the federal grants, uh, you know, it, it's pretty tight. It's ambitious timing and ambitious deadlines. Do you have any sense of when uh, the Tic Tacs are going to be, uh, or at least our Tic Tac in Region Three is going to be up and ready for business? It should be. So we're we're going through the cooperative agreement back and forth process with with colleagues in, in the Region Three office. I believe we should get the award. I think in the last conversation, June. I feel like July is going to be more of a um a date where we do the official launch i mean the official launch is probably more of a soft launch yeah. but even even before that before that launch occurs i hear i hear the other question about there are a lot of federal dollars that are out there it, i mean you know like it's drinking from one a fire hose we're drinking for five fire hoses right now there's <laughs> not one fire hose right so as we as we launch we will also be looking at opportunities that's the really great thing about as tom already said everybody we're leveraging other infrastructure one of our core partners is the Environmental Finance Center. So they are already up and running, ready to go to provide some support as it relates to some of these federal opportunities. Additionally, which is sort of a side note, but relevant to this conversation, the same team who submitted for the Tic Tac and got the Tic Tac, we also are working on a, a Region 3 EPA grant makers uh, opportunity. So we are bringing on foundation partners uh, from the region who can assist us uh, with, you know, on, on the foundation side. So I want to say that's an added bonus. So we've been engaging uh, uh, the Chesapeake Bay Trust, Greater Washington Foundation, uh, William Penn Foundation, uh, other uh, foundations in the Chesapeake Bay regions. And so hopefully, you know, we'll be able to tap into some additional infrastructure. So, because those foundations already have grantee networks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And so they're already in West Virginia doing funding. They're already in Delaware doing funding. Some of these foundations are already in Pennsylvania doing funding. So that'll be another benefit. So regardless of what happens with the grant makers, that'll be infrastructure that we can tap into um, it, on the hard to reach population side. And then another set of resources, just to, let me just slow down a little bit. We have other infrastructure that we'll be leveraging for the tic, for our Tic Tac. So, we received funding from the Robert Johnson Foundation in, uh, I think in December, to start another um, semantic match called the Mid-Atlantic Climate Action Hubs. That's match one. This is actually Tic Tac is match two. <laughs> and so that's actually a mini, a mini technical assistance center and, and, and a mini pass-through. So the same community hubs, they're the hubs on our Tic Tac, are also the same hubs on that. Okay. So, we're, so we're doing some stacking of funding from them to help build their capacity. Remember, Build that capacity and train a trainer. And so, so we've already, through that technical assistance, we've already started doing a grant proposal support for the seat, the collaborative problem solving model. So that went through that. So even if we're not up and running uh, for the Tic Tac by the time the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund RFPs come out, we can leverage that infrastructure and we can also leverage the Environmental Finance Center infrastructure. Okay. And I just wanted to note 
that Erin Sullivan from our office, who is doing, she's our uh, project officer for our Region 3 Tic Tac and is doing great work with you guys. She said that the, uh, the, the EPA as a whole is aiming for July 1st as the, you know, the, the start date for the Region 3 Tic Tac. But uh, I wanted to circle back to something, Dr. Wilson, you had said, because I, it, was, it really kind of struck home for me, which is, you said you want to be one stop shopping for these communities and you you reference in particular you're talking about these hard to reach rural communities that we have in region three and i think that's that's so important because i'm thinking some of these communities we have i'm thinking of one in particular where the mayor is also the librarian right so it's and, and that's not an exaggeration that's the truth so to expect these people to go to one center over here and then go someplace else over here and someplace it's just not realistic. They don't have the, the capacity, the time, and the bandwidth to do that. Um, so, you know, I guess for someone like that who's out in, this is the particular community I'm thinking about, it's out in a very rural community, a hard to reach community. Is it your vision that they could go to any of your hubs that spoke out, go there and, and get fed into the entire like one stop shopping method from whatever hub they happen to uh, tap into? Yeah, that, that's the idea. And one of the things as as we're kind of working out the mechanics of our, our grant bankers, grant proposals, I'm going on a little tangent, is that's we're really in the weeds on that. And one of the things that we realized is, you know, some of these hard to reach population communities, you know, we're gonna have to have office hours where we go to them. Yeah, so for yeah. that mayor, go to the local communities and the local library. So we have to build the infrastructure the hubs enough to have enough, they need to have enough staffing so they actually can send people out and they can actually be present in the library, in the community center, in wherever that place in the community where people congregate, that people access technology, that folks get a chance to, you know, share, you know, do peer sharing, you know, peer networking. So that's one of the things that we learned just through our working on the grant makers proposal. Uh, and so that's something we want to make sure we bring into the TikTok. So that'll be an example of how we could provide, yes, we'll feed them to the larger, into the larger hub, but we'll also go to them. So we want to make sure we go to them. So here's a slightly different question, but for those who've worked with me, know that, that I'm a data junkie. So I'm wondering what sort of measures, not just what EPA imposes, but what sort of measures are you guys thinking about to know when you're successful? I always say, you know, if you don't know where you're going, every place is where you are and you never got anywhere. So what sort of measures yeah. are you guys thinking about in terms of saying, you know what, we're on a good path, we're halfway there, we're a third there, we're finally there, how do we build it out? What, what are you guys thinking about? Yeah, I think, I mean, we're we're going through a process. I know, of course, Aaron has received our performance metrics plan, uh, whether you want to call it PMP, PI, whatever the right way, the, the, the term for it. <laughs> but for everyone who's out there, you know, if you're going to track your progress, you got to build all a logic model. And so many ways the performance uh, metrics plan is a logic model. So of course you have your inputs and part of our inputs again will be, you know, the resources, the staff, Tom, the, the, the leverage partnerships, right? And you have your activities. So the, a lot of the activities are going to be how many, how many communities do we reach each year, right? And we're going to track how many communities do we reach? How many communities do we reach in Delaware? How many communities do we reach in, in Virginia? How many communities do we reach in Urban areas, how many communities have we reached in rural areas? How many communities, uh, how many communities receive technical assistance? How much, how many hours of technical assistance they receive? How many hours of consultation, of coaching? How many hours of workshops they participate in, right? And then we're gonna we're gonna track, you know, how many grants, right? So how many HIAs do they do? I'm gonna go before I get to the grants. How many HIAs? How many maps? Because again, we're the create, we want to build people's capacity to do their own EJ screen maps, they can create their own EJ profiles. So how many profiles do they create, right? And then how many proposals do they uh, do they submit to EPA, DOE, other federal sources, non-federal sources? And then what's their success rate, right? So we want to start out, I think, and I'm not looking at, at the plan, but we want to get to, I think, 50% you know, uh, of these organizations that receive consultation and coaching are submitted proposals successfully, just getting the proposal in. And then we want to see you know, a certain percentage of those getting funding during the time period. And then again, okay, you got the funding, then the actions and outcomes. Do we, and this is this is getting y'all with, with the logic model. For those of you who know logic models, you got to have again your inputs, your you got to have your activities, you know, you, you have your outputs, right? You check those, you know, number of meetings that you have, consultation hours, et cetera. Then you have your short-term, your midterm, 
now your long-term outcomes. Remember, short-term is a change in knowledge and awareness, right? Uh, Mid-term, you see more of a change in skills. You can still change and it can still be short-term, but also changing the behavior of the decision makers, changing access to organizations, changing in, in your number of partnerships. So you can track the number of new partnerships that they also create too. That's an, that's an outcome, right? And how and you can also track the quality of that access to decision-making process through interviews, through focus groups, through surveys. But ultimately, and you know, these Tic Tacs are five years. I was gonna mix it up with the grant mix. The grant mix is three years. We gotta fix that, y'all. That's not enough time, Samantha, on the grant mix, but that's another subject. <laughs> five years. So long term, did you improve air quality? Did you improve water quality? Did you improve access to clean energy infrastructure? You know, how much electrification are these communities getting access to? Do we improve improve access to Wi-Fi? We have to have baseline data in all these communities. So we have to track that when we do, give them technical assistance right. Did you improve jobs? That's another big part of our, of our TikTok is workforce development jobs. People not just being contractors, but creating their own clean energy businesses, for example. So these are all things that are built into our performance metrics plan, but those, those outcomes, the longer term ones, Improvements in you know air quality, water quality, infrastructure, jobs, uh, you know public health, reducing the health disparities. That's all long term. Okay. You know you've mentioned the uh, health impact assessments, the HIA, several times, and uh, I want to ask you about that because coming from EPA, there's a couple of places where we want to institute that, uh, and I've been finding it very challenging getting that done. H how do you do that? Do you partner with uh, local health institutions? How, how does that actually play out in getting a health uh, impact assessment done so so the best hia everybody so so for so those of you that's a that's a very just similar frameworks out there so if any of you remember the care program i love the care program you can go back to the epa care program that has some uh, health impact assessment elements you look at pch it's an acronym it's cdc that has similar elements even the collaborative problem solving model has similar elements but when you think about the health impact assessment you really want to look at What's proposed plan, activity, program, or project, right? Whether it be positive or negative, right? You project to be positive or negative, and then you have to have a, you know, you engage the stakeholder. You, you, you have a scoping phase. Who are the stakeholders, decision makers? Who's going to be impacted by that program, plan, initiative, project, right? And so you want to get baseline environmental data, baseline health data, and, and projections of will this plan, program, initiative, will it increase the you know negatively or will it improve in a positive way right and then you have an iterative process where you track it monitor and do evaluation which is again similar to the epa's collaborative process model you had tracking monitoring evaluation right and so when you do an hia right you know you got to have funding enough staffing enough time but many cases you may end up doing what we call a rapid hia now, some folks do what we call a desktop HIA. I despise those because desktop, <laughs> you can't, a real HIA, if you don't include scoping, which is in, engaging the community, who's going to be impacted by the, you know, the program, yeah. plan, activity, initiative. I don't think it's a real HIA, but, you know, someone can push it, push back on that. Okay, cool. But um, so you can do a desktop HIA and really using US EPA EJ screen, yep. using the CDC EJ index tool. Mm -hmm. Again, maybe not the CGIS tool, not to beat it up. But maybe maybe a little bit of CJS, but more EPA EJ. I'm gonna be nice. EPA EJ screen, be nice. Uh, EJ EJ screen or other tools. But I think the combination of US EPA EJ screen and the CD, CDC EJ index, you can do a rapid HIA. You can do a desktop HIA, but a rapid HIA, you really you can do that, but you really want to engage those community concerns. So you could the HIA can be done in, in, in collaboration with the hub partners. So train them up, right? And I mentioned before how Central Day Employee Familiar has this promotorous model. We can train folks to do HIAs in those communities, following sort of implement the promotorous model. Hmm. And, and in many ways, if another another a term, a term that people may be familiar with, community science. If we're training community scientists, right, folks who affiliate with the hubs, or folks who are affiliated with core community partners in the geographic area coverage of each hub, then they will have the skills to do those rapid HIAs using some of the core tools that of the HIA toolkit, but the core geospatial tools would be US EPA EJ screen and CDC EJ CDC. index. Yeah. So let me put that into a time frame. So it seems to me that what you're saying is 
some folks are going to come to you and they're going to know what they think the problems are and they're going to want you to help them write a grant. And some folks are going to come to you and they're going to say, I'm overwhelmed by the problems. I'm not sure what's causing it. Maybe we should do an HIA. Is that what you're thinking, sir? You like a HIA or like a, a so like a or a needs assessment in the public health parlance, it could be just a basic needs assessment. And then from a positive perspective, it could be an asset assessment, right? What the assets are, uh, asset mapping, and then it can help you map the negatives. And then you look at what are the technical systems needed to better engage decision makers right. or technical systems needed for them to apply for funding to address the problem. Okay. That, that's helpful. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. So we've got about 15 minutes left to go. And... Um, we like to make sure we leave time to open it up to questions. So at this point, if there's any people who haven't already put something in the chat, this would be an, an opportunity to do so. Um, and while we're waiting for those to uh, to kind of roll in, you, you, meant, you mentioned about tying in what you were doing also with jobs and infrastructure, uh, because EPA, we have a limitation. We have certainly clean water, wastewater. Uh, you know, those are our big infrastructure uh, grants, and those are usually the, the kind of the water grants, state revolving. Yeah, that's, your, that's your biggest pot of money, your water, your water yeah. pot, right? Exactly. <laughs> yes, yeah, that's, that's important for our rural, remote communities. Um, sewer, water, infrastructure. You know, sewer, wastewater. That's a, that's a biggie. That's a biggie. Yeah, absolutely. But I'm thinking about, like, for example, when it, this kind of came up, one of the one of the our remote communities, one of the biggest problems they have is getting 5G. And, you know, that's not in EPA's wheelhouse. I know it, I think yeah. agriculture, Department of Agriculture does it. Um, do you have, like, how, how does the hub work where you may reach across to another agency outside EPA, even though, you know, you're an, e, you're an EJ hub, Tic Tac, um, but this community also needs any clean water, but they also need 5G. Yeah, I, I think what we have to do is, and this and this is just the, uh, for everyone, the, what's great about where we are with the current moment and the executive orders on, a, you know, on climate change, 14608, and the new executive order on environmental justice, right? We have the White House Environmental Advisory Council. We have the Interagency Council, right? Samantha, is, that, is the IEC now? Is that what it's called? The IAC? Is it called the, the Interagency Council? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there's multiple opportunities for us to engage with other federal agencies because this all, you know, if you look at the Justice 40 bucket, the Justice 40 initiatives, that is an entryway to engage other federal agencies to make sure that we are, you know, making sure that 40% of the benefits of federal investments go to disadvantaged communities. And so if you think about infrastructure, you have housing infrastructure. So we can be, need to be engaging in energy efficient homes, right? For homes, but HUD, you have transit related infrastructure, public transit, mass transit infrastructure. So DOT, right? Of course, we have Department of Energy, distributed grid, smart grids, electrification, you know, you know, uh, on the consumption side through the RA, on the production side through the RA, right? A lot of infrastructure needs as relates to USD, it's going to come through USDA, our rural remote communities, right? So USDA. So I, so I think, and I think USDA it will be part of the answer to this question. And we will be looking at engaging uh, these other federal agencies and making sure that we have a, a database of inventory of grant opportunities that we know of. We have a, we'll have a calendar where we're gonna be working on the calendar. And then we'll be set up with our partners to make sure we can apply, you know, train folks up and so they can apply for those dollars. But going back to the uh, using the collateral problem sub model, I mean, that element is not in our exact wheelhouse. It's outlined in our Tic Tac, right? But through the collateral problem sub model, we'll be able to connect to those federal agencies and also making sure we bring in partners who are, that's more in their wheelhouse, like the, again, the commission, the Appalachian Commission that you mentioned, uh, uh, Samantha, and others who are doing more of uh, the 5G, um, you know, access issue, addressing that issue and bringing them on board as a partner. So we have two questions. I'm going to read one and then Tom will follow up with the other one. Um, Allison states, did I miss information on the planned grant amount tiers? Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question, Allison. If you feel comfortable putting more information in, that would be helpful. The, the tax art stood up to help people put in for grants. Right. 
They yeah, don't the, have a planned grant amount here, to my knowledge. I leave it to Dr. Wilson and Aaron Sullivan yeah. to correct me. So, so that, so that's the grant maker. So the EPA grant okay. makers, that's due June June thirtieth. Those are fifty million dollar grants. There'll be one per region, and I think one national. And so there are three tiers. Now they call tiers and the grant makers that they should actually be tracks. In our proposal, we're calling them tracks, not tiers, because the way it's outlined, you have to go from like tier one to tier two, tier three, you got three years. You're not going to get to all yeah. three or <laughs> yeah. three years. So they need to be tracks. But I believe uh, tier one is out on the RFA uh, is 150,000. Y'all can correct me. Tier two is 250. I think tier three is 300, something like that. So, All right. yeah. And so, so the, the good thing is, I think our team is going to be well positioned. So the same team who applied for the TikTok will be applying for the grant makers, but Chesapeake Bay Trust is going to be our primary pass through. And then the grant makers, you have to give away 8% of the money. So $40 million has to go out in grants as competitive uh, tier one, tier two, tier three, and non-competitive grants. Okay. So we're doing like a 75, 25 breakdown. The 75% of the funding will be a uh, competitive and 25% of the funding Will be non competitive and non competitive. The, 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 the grant amount is 75000 just for the grant makers. Thank you. Tom? Yes. Yeah, so we have a question. Um, I thought there was going to be a Tic Tac or a hub in Norfolk, but it seems like that must be another program. Do you know anything? Is, is there going to be a hub in the Norfolk area? So right now we will have a Virginia hub. Um, we are looking for. So we want to have a idea. We want to have an urban, more urban focused Virginia hub. And we want to have Virginia hub that's more on the Appalachian part. Or like I said before, we may have like a Western PA, West Virginia, Virginia Appalachian hub. But yes, there will be an urban focus of uh, Virginia hub. But we're, we're trying to find a partner right now. So that's one of the gaps. So we have a couple gaps. We have a Virginia gap. Uh, we have a West Virginia community hub gap as well. And we and we just have a Virginia gap and again, the kind of rural Appalachia gap. And that's why the extra 2 million is gonna help. Okay. So if I, I'm gonna give you a follow-up to that before I read the next one out of the chat box. So if I wanna be that, that urban uh, Richmond Norfolk uh, hub, what do I do? Do I reach out to somebody? What do I do? How do I position myself? If, you, if I you want should, to help fill that void. Yeah, you should send an email to me. I'll put my email in the chat. And so I'm a co I'm the co-director of the of the Tic Tech with Dr. Adrian Hollis. And so you have to send an email to both of us because we're in the process of creating an inventory of potential, you know, uh hubs, both a Virginia hub and also those additional hubs. Now if y'all can look at my background, you probably see a little bit of Pittsburgh Steelers stuff. We're trying <laughs> to have an urban, not not some bias, but Pennsylvania is a large state, so we we have been targeting, we have been talking about having an urban Pittsburgh hub. But you see, Doctor Wilson, you're a Steelers fan, yes, hardcore. But it doesn't mean <laughs> I'm being biased, y'all. So that's one of the things we talked about too. So we're we're trying to figure out what makes sense, but we're definitely going to have a major, you know, one or two uh, either regional Appalachian hubs. No, we definitely have two Appalachian hubs, Appalachian hubs, but either a regional one, definitely regional one, and, and, and definitely a community basis, a specific West Virginia one as well. But you can just email me. I'll put my email. Uh, email somebody said, ain't nothing wrong with that. I see you. <laughs> uh, put my email in the chat. So if you want to, if you want to email, if you want to be that Virginia hub. Thank you. So Thank here's you. another question from Allison in, in Maryland MDE. Will the Tic Tacs assist with matching communities together for regional joint grant applications if they have overlapping priorities and needs? Do you see your role as being a matchmaker as well, sir? Oh, yeah, no, definitely. And that's the, that's the beauty of the collective problems on the model. Because, again, I forget which is, I'm not looking at it right now. I think it's like step two or three uh, mm, strategic partnerships, right? Step three, yep. Yeah, so so that's it's exactly what we can do. We want to leverage as much as possible. And, and, and as I mentioned, sort of tangentially, my comment about the grant makers and, and CBT in the foundation of parlance, they talk about, you know, one the zip, stack, or layer. Right. So you want to zip, stack, and layer as much as possible. And that's part of the reason why, y'all, the logic behind having the same community hubs across multiple projects. So we got to build that capacity up too. 
So and, and so that's what we're that's what we're doing for them, and that's what we do for uh, other organizations who need support, technical assistance and who also need you know the grant writing you know grant writing support. We've also this team also applied for the DOT HUD uh, Tic Tac. We didn't get it. We've been proud for, we've applied for Brownfields funding as a as a collaboration. So we'll continue to do that. Um, and, and and so we want to model that behavior to answer your question. We want to model what you just talked about. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I just want to note that uh, there were some questions about where the hubs were and the, and the uh, Aaron Sullivan very kindly put into the chat a link that has the partners and uh, she says some minor updates are still needed, but that's the most current information up to date. And for Dr. Wilson, I'll just note that my daughter is going to go into her junior year at University of Pittsburgh. So if you uh, we want to meet up there and we can hunt out a spot and take in a game, I'm, I'm up for it. So uh -huh. I need to I need to go to a game. I did go there a few years ago. I stayed at one of the hotels that right that's right on the highway. It was like, how can I be staying? It was weird. It was weird. I'll, but I, I'll tell I you where you need it. to stay. It's right across. I enjoyed the river. it. That was my first time in Pittsburgh. I I bought like I'm not gonna say how much stuff I bought, but I, it's in it's in the, it's in this. You can see it. I bought so much stuff. But I love Pittsburgh. I love the Steelers. <laughs> well, I can yeah, see it. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So Allison Pearson asks, how do we get notified about the hub selections, the vacancies? When will we know when those are going to be filled and how how transparent is this process? Well, how are the selections yeah, so, going to be made now? Yeah, so we have we have shared with Aaron our process. I mean, what we're basically doing, we're we're kind of going to uh, organizations that do the work in these various spaces to say, you know, who are the organizations that, that are doing environmental justice work? Um, frontline, fence line work in these spaces who you think would, would work to be hubs. So those organizations are organizations that we're looking at as the priority organizations, right? So if you're interested in being a hub, we're really targeting those organizations that have a history doing environmental justice work. And in um, Virginia and in West Virginia and, you know, in Western PA. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Western PA. Uh, yeah, exactly. Dominic also had a question, and you may have gone over this, but uh, there was a lot of uh, partners. So he wanted to know whether there will be a Baltimore hub or somewhere close by in Maryland. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. Saw Baltimore Community Land Trust. They in Curtis Bay. There so they saw oh. Baltimore. So, so they do a lot of this stuff with CXX, you know, the CSX explosion, all the goods women stuff. You think what happened with Norfolk Southern, you know, in, in Ohio. Yeah, that issue, their industrial corridor. You know, goods movement, they have a lot of truck traffic. They have the largest medical waste incinerator in the country. They have a coal fired power plant. Uh, they have a, uh, a, 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 a incinerator called Bresco that's impacting, you know, community health. Uh, they're doing a lot around composting to address issues. They, they're doing a lot of really great work. And and that that group emerged out of Free Your Voice, which is a high school driven EJ group where uh, Destiny Watford in 2016 won a Nobel, uh, not a Nobel, won the Goldman Award for uh, environmental activists for stopping another incinerator from being placed on community. It's like the Nobel Peace Prize for environmental activism. <laughs> so that group is very, very active. It's one of our primary EJ groups in the state of Maryland, but also in the region. And this is a, a quick add on. All the hubs, except for the, uh, except for the Overbrook Center, Jerome Shabazz's group in Pennsylvania, all the hubs are also primary partners or members of the Mid Atlantic Environmental Justice Coalition. Magic. Okay. Which so you, again, you named Magic. I find magic. magic I love too, acronyms. So yeah, it, people hated that first, but it stuck. So magic. Yes. Magic. Thank so, you. So so we'll so magic is the so magic is really our community organizing, community obviously grassroots infrastructure. So so the Tic Tac will be a partner to magic. So we'll be working with magic to get to some of these organizations, these, these communities as well, that are experiencing environmental energy justice issues. Okay, uh, Dominic asked if you could repeat the name of that group because he didn't catch it. Uh, oh yeah, South Baltimore, South Baltimore Community Land Trust, S-B-C-L-T. There you go. Yeah. Well, we're almost out of time. So let me turn it over to uh, Samantha and Dr. Wilson for the last words. So as usual, Dr. Wilson, you didn't disappoint. You're filled with information and you're also filled with a lot of enthusiasm and energy. I'm going to call it the IEE -E, just for you. <laughs> but I do think that this okay. is an exciting opportunity. I think this is a once in a lifetime opportunity that the Biden administration has provided. I want us to seize it. I want us to move the needle in a way that's permanent and, the, and that lasts. So with that, I turn over to you closing remarks. 
No, I'm definitely really excited. Like Samantha just said, it's a once lifetime moment. You know, we this at least for me, I'm all about doing science that serves serves the people. And so, how can we use this tic tac these resources to be responsive to the needs of the people? Those have been forgotten and visible lives, right? So, so this is a moment for those of you who are on the call who are interested in being partners. I put my email in the chat. Please email me. If you want to be a partner, if you have resources and infrastructure to help be part of the solution. So happy to work with you. We're looking forward to getting an award, you know, in July and having a, and having the launch. And, and again, really, really exciting times to um for doing for doing this work. So thank you again for the time. Thank you for being here. Thanks to everyone who tuned in to hear a little bit more. Dr. Wilson's been very uh, generous in putting his information in the chat. Our information is also available in the chat. There's no such thing as a silly question. Reach out. Let's network. Let's talk. Let's see how we can make this thing work and we can actually move the needle in a permanent way for our underserved communities throughout the Mid-Atlantic region. Thank you all.